Welcome to the Grace Vineyard Podcast, where we are building growing communities of worshipers who are becoming like Christ, empowered to do His work. We hope you enjoy this message. My name is Ron. If I haven't met you yet, welcome. I'm glad you're here. We have been doing a series called Witness, Stories from the First Jesus Followers, primarily looking through stories in the book of Acts in the Bible. Um, today, we're going to shift it up just a little bit. Oh, the title's not up. Put the title up there for me, if you would, because I want to read that. Uh, it's not available, huh? There it is. So I crossed out the first and changed it to today's Jesus followers. So we're going to still do some stories about witness. And it, kind of the thrust of this comes from something Jesus said on the night of his resurrection when he met with many of the disciples and others and told them, he opened their minds to understand the scriptures about himself. He said, you know, it's written that the, the Messiah, the Christ, would suffer and be killed and be raised from the dead on the third day and forgiveness of, of sins in his name would be preached to the whole world. And he said to his followers, you're witness of this now. And you're going to receive the promise of the Holy Spirit. And you're going to take this message to the whole globe. And he said the same thing again. And it's recorded in Acts 1.8. He said, you know, wait, because in a little bit, the Holy Spirit is going to be poured out. The promise of the Father. And you'll receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And you'll be my witnesses. There's the phrase again. So that's what I honed in on as we were studying the, the Pentecost Day together some weeks back. And then we started this series of um, talking about witness. We're going to do that today. It's going to be a little different. It's going to be kind of story-based. And I'm not only going to invite Michael to tell his story, of uh, his Jesus story, but I'm also going to be sharing with you um, a video clip, with um, an extended video clip, that's also about finishing the mission. I have a sense that today is a day of calling for some of you, and I want to right now challenge you to approach the rest of our time together with something called faith. If you would at some point read in your Bibles, I think it's Mark 4.24 or 14.24, can't remember now. Uh, one of those two, I'm pretty sure. Jesus says this, be careful how you listen, because with the measure of faith that you bring to your listening, that's what you're going to get out of it. In other words, if I have gallons of fresh water and you come up to the water with a thimble for a drink, that's all you get. But if you come with your 64-ounce uh, you know, flask, that's how much you're going to drink. So, yeah, your big gulp. So it's, it's, a, it's a truth that you and I get more out of people presenting the Word of God when we come with faith that we'll receive. Make sense? So I'm asking you right now to kind of position your soul, your heart, your mind to receive something. I have a suspicion that some of you, if it hasn't already happened this morning, are going to hear a sense of God's call on your life. So I'm going to introduce Michael, and then there's going to be another thing I'm going to do, and then I'm going to lead us in a ministry time at the end. So there's kind of three segments today. Lord, we thank you for your presence here today. We thank you for the work of the Spirit to restore broken lives. We thank you for calling us to partner with you to bring restoration to people everywhere. I pray that you speak to us today as Michael shares his story of how you interacted in his life. I pray that we will learn from you and we will be inspired and we will be called into action. Your kingdom be upon us right now. In Jesus' name, amen. So this is my friend Michael Aplikowski. Um, when we first met, he didn't know what to think of me, and I didn't know what to think of him. <laughs> it's true. Huh. <laughs> and you know what? We love each other dearly now. We, we, we spent time together and realized, oh, this guy's not, all, not very bad at all. No, yeah, oh, yeah, and yeah. Then, and if you didn't know, Michael and I traveled to Zambia. Was that, that was earlier 
That's last August. We, it we was left. 2023. Yeah. So, yeah. So, and, and we, really, yeah. we really became close yeah. and enjoyed our time together serving in Zambia. Um, and Michael can't tell you his whole story. If he did, it would, it would be hours and hours. And you'll want to get to know him if you don't already. He has a, one of, just like everyone, has a story of Jesus intercepting his life. And he's going to just give us a couple highlights that will be helpful today. It's so encouraging to hear how Jesus intercepts a life that was headed to nowhere good and then turns it around and uses that life to bring not only glory to God, but to rescue the lives of many more. And that's what's happening in Michael's life right now. So take some time and tell us what you have All for right. us, okay? Wow, he said take some time. Um, first thing I want to do is just um, I, I pray, Heavenly Father, that uh, what I witnessed, what I experienced, be impacted by the people I speak to today in the same way that it impacted me and begin to change the hearts and minds and transform the lives of those that I'm about to give witness of, of who you are, your love, your power in my life. It's in the holy name of Jesus Christ, I pray, amen. All right, we're going to move a few things around. I'm probably going to move around a little bit. This list says, pick up donuts, get dry cleaning. Wait a minute, wrong notes. Um, <laughs> it might as well say that. Um, I don't want to spend a lot of time telling you about my ashes and the dirt that I lived in. I, I do want to touch on something that had a profound impact on my life. It kind of shaped and molded the relationship that I would develop or had developed with God. And it goes back, um, I was uh, born in Brooklyn. Um, I'm going to quote a little bit from the, uh, from the book of Brooklyn um, from time to time. Very rarely re read book. It's somewhere in the back. Um, but um, so I grew up, uh, you know, my mother was a single parent. Um, she, she, for all her faults and all her flaws, she loved God dearly. And, and uh, she, she, she was a huge part of our lives. We were Catholics. My mother lived like a Catholic lived. A lot of rules, a lot of rituals, a lot of different things. Um, and so she was trying to raise us. And um, when I was a little boy in, 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 in the Catholic church, you have to go to like classes to learn how to receive communion. And you do that when you're a kid. And so I went to a public school, and you had to go to the Catholic school to take a class. It was called catechism, and you took it every Wednesday. So we would get it let out at lunchtime, and the, the, they would walk us from the public school to the Catholic school. And we would get religious instruction there on how to receive communion. So um, we would walk over there. And I lived between the public school and the Catholic school, and all my friends that went to Catholic school, because I was the only one that didn't go to Catholic school pretty much on my block, would be out in the street playing. So I never really made it to catechism. <laughs> it started young. And um, so I, I would stop, and I would play with them, and then I would go up on home and all that good stuff. Um, and so what, what um, a little bit later, we would all, it turned out, receive communion on the opening day of our baseball game. My, my, my church had a little league, okay, and not the catechism class, but the whole church and all the kids that participated in the little league that all went to Catholic school except for me um, would have a parade that ended at the church before the game started, and they would all get called up and go receive communion. So I'm going, I'm in the parade, and, and my mother worked. She, had, she was a beautician, so Saturday was a big day. She wasn't there with me. We had a woman that came, um, I think, from British Honduras at the time, and, and she watched us. You know, she took care of us. And so we, were walk, we went to the, the parade, ended in church, and everybody got called up to receive Holy Communion. Figured, why not? So I went up to receive Holy Communion. The poor woman from British Honduras almost fainted, thought for sure she was going to lose her job for allowing me to commit this grave sin. She ran home. She took me home after the game. She called my mother. My mother thought, wow, I just got divorced from the church. I'm already in hot water. Now my son decides he's going to receive Holy Communion 
without, you know, the blessing of the church. So she took me up to see the, the priest um, that night. It happened to be poker night for him. He was down the block playing poker. Um, he was not happy to have to come back to the, I think it's called the rectory, to address this issue of this woman that was hysterical. Now, he asked me what happened. I told him, you know, I went up there, I took this thing, I'm forgiven for my sins. He was, he was pleased with it, went back to his poker game, gave me a blessing, told my mother, don't worry, he's, he's going to go to heaven, it'll be okay. Um, <laughs> and so I learned a few things there. I learned that this woman that loved God so much was so afraid. And I learned that you can do things wrong and God would be pissed off. And that you needed another man to tell you it was okay. I learned all these different things all in one shot. But that's the God I grew up with. And um, I would uh, later give God good reason to be pissed at me. I'm a recovering drug addict. For those of you that are recovering drug addicts, I need say no more. For those of you that aren't, I was um, a soldier in the army of Satan. I lied, I cheated, I stole, I killed, and I destroyed. And I did it well. And I did it with bravado. And um, I'm not going to sit here and tell you all the stories, guys. It's, it's senseless. What I will tell you is how it ends up. I was on a meridian. Many of you may have seen me. Many of you may have not. I would hold a sign asking for money, singing Amazing Grace at the top of my lungs. I lived in bushes. Um, uh, uh, what is it called? The, the tunnels. Yeah, drainage ditch. I did that for 10 or 12 years. When I got to go to jail or prison, that was home improvement for me. You know, I was moving up. My family did not want a whole lot to do with me anymore. Like, I wasn't getting invited to church. My sister went to this church for a while, and, and nobody wanted me coming anywhere. And, um, um, and I was content to live that way. I would go to jail, and I would tell them, I'm here because I did it, and when I leave, I'm going to do it again. And it ended that way. I was a joke by that time. You know, there was no gangster left in me. There was no... I, I would get, they would take me to jail so frequently for like 12 hours to sober up or clean up. And when they would release me, many times you get bologna sandwiches when you go to, they would give me bologna sandwiches when I left. I was like Otis of Mayberry, you know, and, and I was a joke. I was a, jo Brand, I was a joke to Brandy. I was, a, you know, we were, another story. But anyhow, so I don't want to paint the picture other than what it was. That's what I was. And, and I had no faith or belief that God could love me. So I had done so many terrible things, unspeakable crimes. And, and, and I, I, you know, I'm a 12-stepper. And 12-steppers, we have to come to believe that a power greater than ourselves could restore us to sanity. And we have to turn our will and our lives over the care of God as we understand him. And the way I understood him, <laughs> you know, People used to think I was a, an agnostic. I said, no, I'm not an agnostic. I believe in God. I just feel I'm in a whole lot of trouble with him. And, and, and that, that I'm not worthy of his love. You know, that I'm not. That I don't deserve it. That the life I have is the life I deserve. That I made choices and I should live with those choices. And I, and, and, and I got clean at times, you know, but I couldn't stay clean. Because that peace was missing. That peace was missing. I was forever trying to be validated. I was forever trying to, to live up to some kind of, I don't know, that I just couldn't do. Because I thought if I did better and I acted better and I did more, but you just can't. On your own power, you cannot. And I couldn't heal. I couldn't heal. Because I couldn't be comfortable with who I was for a long time. So about 10, 12 years into my being homeless, um, to, to speed it up for you, um, I, I made a decision to try to get clean, and, and my sister was there for that decision. And though she had not let me be part of her life for a long time, I had never lied to her. I had never said, you know, I want to be clean. I said, no, 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 no. I'm going to do this till the wheels fall off. But I told her, you know, I'm going to give this a shot. And, and um, she invited me to live in her home. And um, I did that, and I was trying my best, you know. Um, but I was so depressed and so defeated and so beat and just felt that the day is going to come again 
when I'm going to go back in use. And I was, I was just defeated. You know, I had no, no, I had faith that God was going to get me, you know. And um, so a snake came along at some point. Uh, talk about two broken guys in a broken world. And um, he was, became my, um, my 12-step sponsor, pretty much in name only for the first, I don't know, 15, 17 months. I stayed clean on, on you know, on, on uh, I don't know, fear. And, and then one day my sister went off to New York and, and, and I went and I relapsed and we had a deal that if, um, that if I got high, I would leave. And, um, um, and, you know, she was coming back from a funeral. We lost my aunt. I knew she wasn't going to go for my shenanigans, you know. So I was getting, um, getting ready to leave her house about the third day of my relapse. What that I don't remember. Um, and uh, Snake and I had uh, participated, begun to participate in something called Authentic Manhood here at the church. And we, had, uh, we were going to be showing up at 8 o'clock that morning. He was going to show up at the house at 7 and all that good stuff. And uh, my sister had a house, you know, where you just let yourself in. You know, the doors weren't locked or anything like that. And I had called Snake the night before and left a message on his answering machine, knowing I wouldn't get him, you know, telling him, don't bother to pick me up tomorrow. You know, I was going to leave in the morning and, and go finish what I started. And uh, he let himself in, came downstairs, and said, come here, fool. He said, I love you. And he came and he held me in his arms. And uh, from that moment on, the abundance of God's grace was really clear to me what it really meant to live in the grace of God. Yeah, I was a fool. He knew who I was. He knew everything I did. He knows everything I'm going to do. And in spite of that, he said, I love you. And that's when I met Jesus, truly met Jesus. I come to understand the abundance of God's grace, God's grace that allowed me to, to be back in my mother's life, to allow me to be a son again, to allow me to be a brother again, and to allow me, as I'm going to describe to you, to experience the kingdom of God here and now on earth as it is in heaven any time I call on it. I know there's a heaven. Trust me, and I know there's a hell. So at that point, Mark Newell, he's back there somewhere. Um, oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, go do that to me, huh? <laughs> and um, he, he'd been bothering me about going out and feeding the homeless with some sandwiches and, and uh, praying for them. He had this crazy idea. And... Um, um, and I had been avoiding him. He, he was my roommate. He lived 20 feet away from me. But I was trying my best not to go do this. And uh, one day I said yes. One day I made myself available. And, uh, and we went with 12 peanut butter and jelly sandwiches over here to the transit center. We gave them out and we began to pray for people. Today I give out about 1,200 of those a month. Took, took two loaves and some fish to God, and that's what he did with it. But more than that, more than that, I experienced something that, that I didn't understand at the time. Um, I'm looking for Luke 4.18, but it's not coming up, but you heard it, and that's my mantra. That's what I live by. I believe it's the only ministry. That's the ministry of Jesus Christ. Everything else stems from it. Um, so we went out there, we did that, and then Samuel Madsen, who was an associate pastor here, assistant pastor, he was something here. He used to run around barefooted, looking, like I always say, a cross between Dobie Gillis and Jesus Christ. And um, um, I'll probably repeat a lot of things that you've heard from me already. The truth don't change. I'm going to do my best to tell you the truth. Um, Sam got a hold of the fact that I went out and prayed for people. He said, come on, man. Blah, blah, blah. And he'd been trying to get me to do things. I don't know what was wrong with him. Some, somebody prophesied to him or something was, he, whatever. He saw something in my life, and, and it would come to be true. Um, but he said, Will you go out? let's go out together. He said, meet me at Walmart. And I, you know, and I said, oh, that's a good spot. I know a lot of homeless people. So I go out to Walmart. I meet him there. No peanut butter and jelly sandwiches, nothing. We're, you know, we're unarmed, in my opinion. And um, um, so, uh, 
This is the idea he gets. He tells me we're going to go inside, and he gives me this formula. You all know it. Can I ask you a question? If somebody says yes, you say, me and my buddy love to pray for people. Can I pray for you? Ask them what they want prayer for. Zap them with the best 15, 30 seconds, whatever, and, 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 and see what happens. All right? So this is what we're going to do. He said, all right, you know I'm going over, right, Ron? Yeah. All right. Um, yeah. All right. Um, yeah. We knew this, though, when he called me. Um, so, uh, so we, we, you know, he says, we're going to go in there now. He says, I want to tell you something else. He says, I don't know what will happen, what'll, you know, what we'll do. But you're going to come to know Jesus in a way that you never knew him before. That's what's going to happen. So I was like, okay, so like, where are we going? He says, we're going in Walmart. He says, follow me. So I want you to know something else, too. He says, I have a vision I've seen that people, you're, people are going to be following you, doing this with you in the next couple of years. You're going to have people that you disciple that disciple other people. I'm like, well, I might not even follow you into Walmart, let alone people follow me, because that's where he wants to go. So we go up and down the aisles of Walmart. Um, we, we found the, the section between the mana and the red wine. And we started praying for people. And um, I've never stopped. That was thousands of people ago. Thousands of people ago. Long, many. And what never stopped, too, was what he told me. In order for me to be able to do that, to understand how to heal and to know the love of God, I need the love of God. So as I think the person in front of me is who I'm praying for and who I'm healing, what I find out is in their suffering, in what they're going through, I am coming closer to Jesus as I learn to be as much like him or let him be, I can't be like him, but I could be like me in trying to be like him and letting him be into my life. And I so desperately need that. I so desperately need that. As I heal in that process, my ability to heal and to love grows and grows, and I get to experience amazing things. I'll talk about a few of them really quickly. Um, I would later start to go out. Stephen Beck would come around. He asked. He volunteered once. That was four years ago. He's not done yet. Um, we're still driving around most days. And, and so he would come and get me. We'd make our sandwiches. We'd go out and... Um, and, and, and hand out sandwiches and create encounters that uh, led to prayer. And um, like some examples, so one day we're driving down a street and um, there's this guy laying in the street writhing in pain. Some of you have heard the story, some of you haven't. And um, he's like, oh man, he's in a lot of pain. And this young girl that we had ministered to and prayed for multiple times, she's homeless, she's about 85 pounds, you know, just lost, comes running up to us, say, hey, please come, come here, this is Jimbo's in the street, he's got cancer, all this rambling on, please pray for him, pray for him. She runs over to him, says, can these guys pray for you, can they pray for you? And, um, you know, he has fourth, uh, fourth stage prostate cancer, I believe, or something like that he had, she was explaining to me. So he's down there, and, and, and I go down to pray for this guy, I don't remember what I said. I do remember this, though. He had this walking stick with this thing with him, and he jumps up and he grabs it. I think, you know, I'm in trouble. You know, I just touched this guy's stomach, and he's not happy. So I'm looking for Stephen, you know, with the car. I'm gonna... And he starts circling around and saying, what happened? What happened? What happened? He was no longer in pain. Wow. What happened is that the kingdom of God broke through and ruled and reigned in that, in that space. That became a space where there was no more suffering, no more tears, and no more pain. His, his will was done here on earth as it is in heaven, right then and there. That I got to see. Another time, we were pulling into a gas station. I was, actually, because... Um, Stephen and I used one particular gas station because of the price. So I had just been allowed to drive after many, many years. That's another miracle, but we won't talk about that. And um, um, so I'm pulling into this gas station that's much higher priced than the other one and, and feeling wickedly evil about it because Stephen doesn't know. And, um, um, and uh, so there's this guy 
there, and he grabs me, and uh, so I pay for the gas, and, 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 he, and he's pointing me out to me, this is the guy, this is the guy, this is the guy. Apparently, what had happened was this. Um, several weeks or months before, I forget, it was a while before, because we hadn't been in that gas station in a long time. Um, this guy was, this, he was sitting on the side of the gas station, and, and we, we began to pray for him, and he talked about wanting a job in the gas station. And being, now, this guy is sitting in his own urine, and he's disheveled, and we went and got some water to help him clean up and prepare, I guess, for his interview, and we prayed for him, and we prayed with him, and... Um, and at some point, he got the boldness to go in and get an application. And uh, they hired him at some point. And his life was totally turned around. You see, <laughs> the kingdom is here, and it's not, and it's there, and it's not, and it's here, and it was there, and it's going to be here. And it's, you know that part, right? You following me? God was working. God was working. And he wanted me to know something that day. He wanted me to know that, <laughs> change my faith, you know, change. Because sometimes you go out and pray for hundreds of people, thousands of people, and nothing happens in front of you. And that can be painful, and it can hurt. It can make you cry. It can make, you, make it difficult to sleep sometimes, wondering why, you know. I don't wonder anymore. I, I know, I have absolute faith that when I pray, God is working. I, I don't know when, where, or how, but I promise you, He's working. He's working really strongly. Um, I don't want to take up too much more time. Uh, I, I want to go in to end with this, if I could. That's when I met the Holy Spirit. So I knew, now I met Jesus. There's three of them, by the way, guys. Yeah, a lot of work to do. Ain't one guy doing all of it, trust me. And... Uh, um, that relationship is powerful, it's amazing, but it's very different than this last relationship I'm going to describe. It's even different than the one from Jesus. Um, I have a recliner in my room, and I'm going to talk to you about my recliner. And, 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 and what I do, too, is also is, is to prepare to hear the Father, to see what the Father wants to do, to be able to come and do this, to be able to come and do what I do all day, because I'm a very broken person. And throughout the day, I might get angry with Brandy, hang up the phone on Snake, slam doors, do all kinds of insane, be afraid, be, be doubtful, be a whole bunch of different things. Definitely egotistical, arrogant, you know, um, obnoxious, all these things. Yeah, shocking, ain't it? But he uses me. <laughs> but, but he uses me. He can use that powerfully. Powerfully. Back. We'll leave that alone. But anyhow, so I start my mornings and I try my best to, uh, to spend some time with God. I get up and I got to go back to sleep because I get up so early and, and, um, and, and I like quiet time and I don't have any regiment or, or dis, you know, specific disciplines except to make that time available. And people interfere with it all the times in the mornings and everything like that. So I start out the day and sometimes I'm actually bent already because I didn't get the time I need. And we go into a prayer group. He interferes that with that almost on a daily basis. And so, you know, and, and, but now I set out and, 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 um, and, I, and I go through my day. And somewhere in the middle of the afternoon or late part of the afternoon, I find myself back at home. I go in my room. I shut the door. And I sit in my recliner. And I give God everything. I ask him why. I, I, I repent for my behaviors. I, uh, I thank him for what I get to participate in and be a part of. And I just lay there. Sometimes I read. Sometimes I fall asleep. Sometimes, um, and here's what I found out. One day I realized that when I'm done doing that, usually I have a great amount of clarity on some things and a great amount of peace that lasts me at least till the evening. In a hot, humid room, to a sinner like myself, in the middle of the afternoon, God the Father comes to be with me.
I think I'm done. Thank you, Michael Aplikowski. I think I'm not the best planner, because I thought I was also going to show you about a 20-minute <laughs> video conversation. <laughs> but I'll save that for another time. I'll tell you something, though, that You'll hear if I show you this video. It's a conversation between Rick Warren, by the way, and Jay Pathak. Some of you would know those names. One of the things Rick says is that he's discovered that in God's garden, even the broken trees bear fruit. In God's garden, even the broken trees bear fruit. And if you don't happen to know that name, Rick Warren, he's the guy that started a, just a mega church up in Orange County called Saddleback. He's the guy that wrote the book, The Purpose Driven Life, that maybe you've heard of. When his son, who had battled with mental illness for years and years, when his son lost his battle and, and took his own life, it, Rick said it was so devastating to walk through an airport and CNN's on you know, the TVs, and there on the ticker tape across is saying, Rick Warren's son, Matthew, took his life. You've seen that, like the world's talking about it. And he got thousands and thousands, tens of thousands of letters from people, comfort and sympathy letters. And he said, you know, the, the, the letters from the rock stars and the presidents and the, you know, leaders of countries, None of them compared to the many, many, many letters of people who were suffering with mental illness and said, Rick, your son in a, like a chat room, a suicide room, a mental health site, website, where you could chat, led me to Jesus, and I'm going to heaven now, and I'm in relationship with the Lord because of what your son did. In God's garden, broken trees bear fruit. And the reality is that we are all broken. We are all broken. And that's who God uses. And one, one of the statistics that I heard that I want to share with you, because I, I'm going to use this to lead into a ministry time, Ministry time meaning when we're going to pray for each other. The, the Southern, when there's the Baptists in general, it's huge denominations. They, they're really good at keeping records of things and statistics and all. One of the things they discovered was that the, the average Baptist pastor received his calling to ministry when he was seven years old. The average Baptist minister a missionary, I'm sorry, missionary, one that's called to be in missions, received their calling when they were five years old. Isn't that interesting? And I had the thought last night and this morning when I was praying for you that there might be some of you who as a child knew that God was calling you, setting you apart to serve him. And through life circumstance, you walked away, did something else. And you're one of the people that we want to pray for today. When, at the end, we're going to invite our prayer teams and, and people to come forward. Everyone gets to play in God's kingdom. Everyone gets to be in ministry. Everyone gets to pray for the sick. Everyone gets to lead people to Jesus. But it's true that some are set apart to positions of leadership, to calls of God to do more than just be like everyone gets to play. And actually, you know, in rugby, <laughs> I talked about that because my son plays rugby, I discovered what a cool sport. Everyone can carry the ball in rugby. I don't know if you knew that. It's not like football where there's like a few elite people get to carry the ball. And if you play rugby, everyone gets to carry the ball. 
Anyone can touch it. And I was talking with a friend about, you know, that kind of comparison with the kingdom of God where everyone gets to play. And he said, yeah, actually, it's not everyone gets to play. It's everyone needs to play. In the rugby team, if you're not playing hard with 100%, you, you shouldn't be on that team. And it's kind of that way in the body of Christ. Everyone gets to play, but everyone needs to play. So you're in my hearing right now, and we've been talking about our calling to be witnesses, to tell people what we've seen, what we've heard, what we've experienced, and what we've learned. One of the things that will be talked about in that video segment that I'll show you at some point was a group of people that have been working the last, oh, 23 years, I think, on something called Finish the Task, FTT, Finish the Task. Finishing the task of taking the gospel of Jesus to every tribe, every tongue, every nation, every language. And um, they're doing a pretty good job. There's not that many left. We're reaching everyone in the planet is the plan. And there are some people actively, brilliantly working on how we do that as the whole body of Christ. And you're part of that plan finishing the task. One of the things we like to say around here regarding vision, vision is a description of a preferred future. So when we talked about, well, what's our vision of a preferred future? We said, well, we'd like everyone everywhere to know and worship God in all his goodness and glory, because that's the end game. The knowledge of the glory of the Lord, the prophet says, will cover the earth like waters covering the sea. So our vision of the future is that everyone, everyone, everywhere will know and worship God in all his goodness and glory. The task isn't finished. There are some people in your life who don't know and aren't worshiping God in all his goodness and glory. And you are called. And my sense is today that some of you here are going to be tapped on the shoulder or touched in the heart this morning by the Holy Spirit, saying there's more for you. Now, there is no vision in the body of Christ that looks like this. My vision is to find the church that gives me the best experience so I can go there and have a good experience. That kind of consumer attitude, that's not one of your options. That's not available to us. Our vision is to take our place. And for the, for the mission to be completed, some of you, some of us need to answer the call and lead a Bible study somewhere. To step up to the plate and gather some people and open the Bible and pray together and read the Bible together. Some of us need to go and teach children, the ones who hear the call of God on their life when they're five and seven, some of us need to answer the call to teach children about Jesus. Some of us need to step up and say, you know what, I have a home and I love making people welcome. I'm going to open my home to some kind of gathering where people can encounter Jesus. Some people might have a calling. You're, you're tapping on your heart that you heard when Michael was sharing. You know, he right now has made a way for anyone to join him, and I'm doing it, a, I've done it a few times now, on Monday nights, to go where people that are unsheltered are congregating and show up sometimes with food and some clothing that whole thing is kind of disorganized and haphazard, and it just sort of happens. Something to give as a connection point where we meet people in their suffering and pain and are kind to them and pray over them. And they get touched and encounter the kingdom of God, but generally the people that are going get a little bit more out of it than anyone else. We're the ones that get changed. Some of you, when you hear... Um, a Jennifer and a Thelma going to Rwanda 
and you hear the stories of missions that we talk about all the time, some of you might actually hear God say, I have another nation in mind to send you to. When you have those thoughts come to you and those, those hungers come to your soul, you really do well to not ignore that. You really do well to not ignore that because God is calling you. The mission has not been finished. I know uh, the theologian from the Langham Partnership that equips ministers all over third world countries, Chris Wright, has said it's not so much that God has a church for his, uh, that God has a mission for his church. You know, what's your mission? It's not so much that God has a mission for his church, but that God has a mission and God has a church for his mission. God has a mission in the world. He is restoring broken lives around the planet, introducing people to the rule and reign of himself, God's kingdom, where we taste now of the kingdom that is to come, where all things are made new, and there's no more sorrow, and no more mourning, and no more poverty, and no more death, and no more sickness, and no more sin. We are tasting of that now when the kingdom of God comes near us. When you come near to Jesus and you put your faith in him, you taste of what is to come. And it's a real taste. It's not the full meal yet. That's coming when Jesus returns. But it's a taste. When our sins are removed and we get to know what it feels like to stand clean before God with no guilt because he's taken our guilt away by the blood of Jesus Christ. When at least at times... We pray for the sick, and God removes the sickness and restores them, like he did when Michael was praying for the man with the cancer. Sometimes we pray for people, and what they experience is the love of God and the strength of God to endure what they're going through. And I still don't understand why some get healed and some don't, but I do know that they all get touched when we pray. There's a mission to fulfill. Everyone gets to play, but today... I wonder if the Holy Spirit is calling some of you to no longer have the attitude of a consumer, but to realize you're in an army, and you've been called by God to play a role, because it takes everyone on the team to take their part. There's a mission to fulfill, and God has created the church for his mission, and you are part of it. It's time for some of us to take our place. And so what I want to do now is I'm going to invite a prayer team. People in our church that you know, you know who you are. You love to pray for people. You probably are in some kind of leadership. or I don't, You just know how to pray. You've been through a training possibly. I'd like for you to start to make your way up. But I'm going to pray over us, and I'm going to invite the Holy Spirit who is everywhere all the time, to particularly manifest himself right now. And I have a sense that he's going to be tapping some of you on the shoulder, touching some of you in your heart, saying, I'm calling you to step up. And if you experience that, you're going to want to come down and have people lay hands on you and bless you. Some of them might hear a word from God. We call that prophecy. They'll speak something that God is saying to encourage you. Might not happen. Might happen. They're going to be listening for that. Why don't you stand up? Put yourself in a posture to receive whatever that is for you. Sometimes that's open hands before the Lord. Holy Spirit, we invite you to come right now. Holy Spirit, rest on these people. Lord, we're going to be praying for some of us, and we're asking that you do your work. And I'm asking that you call those that you have had your eyes on into their place. Father, I pray for those who as 
children or young adults heard your voice and they didn't respond at the time, but they're being reminded right now of that day when you called them, that you'll renew the calling today. And listen, if that is particularly your situation, would you please come to the front and have some people pray over you? If you are sensing a drawing from the Lord to take your place, to step up to take a role of service in God's community, to be trained how to lead a Bible study, to be stepping into a life of intercession, praying for the church. We have a place for you. Praying for the world. We have a place where we do that. You might be feeling that thing where I said hospitality. You have a house. It's time to open up your house. And you say, I don't know what to do. Come, let us bless that. And God may fill your house with moments where people are encountering the living God in your living room because you said yes. Some of you might be sensing the call to literally go on a plane to another nation and serve. We will pray over that and bless it, and the Holy Spirit will begin to make clear the next steps. Lord, let your kingdom come upon us. Let your will be done amongst us. We say yes, Lord. If you're in the hearing of my voice, you heard what Michael said, and, and you have yet to really meet Jesus, that grace that meets you no matter how foolish you've been. Would you respond to Jesus right now? The Bible describes him as standing knocking on a door that you open. And he's saying, I want to come in. I want to have fellowship with you. Would you open the door and let me in? If you're in that place right now, just look up to him and say something like this, Jesus, I believe you and I believe in you. Please come into my life. I believe that there is repentance and forgiveness of sins in your name. So I turn to you and say, I'm sorry, Lord for not walking with you all this time. I want to walk with you now. Please come into my life. Please cleanse me of all the bad things I've done. Please fill me with your spirit so that I can walk with you and help bring restoration to others. I give you my life. You're now the boss. You're now in charge of me. I'll follow you with everything I got, so come and fill me, Lord. Amen. I can declare to you that if you prayed a prayer like that to God, that though your sins may have been many, they've just been washed away. Forgiven and cleansed. Born anew filled with the Spirit of God. So the worship bands behind me, they're going to they're gonna be worshiping Jesus right now. You're welcome to join them as they worship and uh, perhaps come and get some prayer for anything other than what I've talked about. It's fair game. Anything's available. Um, take your place. Everyone gets to play. Everyone needs to play. I don't know what your plans are for this evening, but I can tell you there'll be a group of people in the lobby at six, worshiping, opening the word of God together, praying for each other in our Sunday night gathering. I'd invite you to come back at six. I'm done now. May the Lord bless you and keep you and make his face to shine upon you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you rest. Amen. We hope you've enjoyed this message. This weekly podcast is available on our website, gracevcf.org, 
where you can learn more about Grace Vineyard and our vision for people everywhere to know and worship God.